There's nothing I can do, and I'm glad of it. The bull will let her by, and she will go away with Lear. It is as right as anything. I'm only sorry about the unicorns. The prince had not yet noticed her offered hand, but in a moment he would turn and see, and touch her for the first time. He will never know what she has given him, but neither will she. The red bull lowered his head and charged. He came without warning, with no sound but the rip of his hooves, and if he had chosen, he could have crushed all four of them in that one silent onslaught, but he let them scatter before him and flatten themselves into the wrinkled walls, and he went by without harming them, though he might easily have horned them out of their shallowed shelters like so many periwinkles. Supple as fire, he turned where there was no room to turn and met them again, his muzzle almost touching the ground, his neck swelling like a wave. It was then that he roared. They fled and he followed, not as swiftly as he had charged, but quickly enough to keep each one alone, friendless in the wild dark. The ground tore underneath their feet, and they cried out, but they could not even hear themselves. Every bellow of the red bull brought great slides of stone and earth shuddering down on them, and still they scrambled along like broken insects, and still he came after them. Through his mad blaring, they heard another sound, the deep whine of the castle itself as it strained at its roots, drumming like a flag in the wind of his wrath, and very faintly, there drifted up the passageway the smell of the sea. He knows. He knows. I fooled him once that way, but not again. Woman or a unicorn, he will hunt her into the sea this time, as he was bidden, and no magic of mine will turn him from it. Haggard has won. So the magician thought as he ran, all hope gone for the first time in his long, strange life. The way widened suddenly, and they emerged into a kind of grotto that could only have been the bull's den. The stench of his sleeping hung so thick and old here that it had a loathly sweetness about it, and the cave brooded gullet red, as though his light had rubbed off on the walls and crusted in the cracks and crevices. Beyond lay the tunnel again, and the dim gleaming of breaking water. The Lady Amalthea fell as irrevocably as a flower breaks. Schmendrick leaped to one side, wheeling to drag Molly Grew with him. They brought up hard against a split slab of rock, and there they crouched together as the Red Bull raged by without turning. But he came to a halt between one stride and the next, and the sudden stillness, broken only by the bull's breathing and the distant grinding of the sea, would have been absurd, but for the cause of it. She lay on her side with one leg bent beneath her. She moved slowly, but she made no sound. Prince Lear stood between her body and the bull, weaponless, but with his hands up as though he still held a sword and shield. Once more in that endless night, the prince said, No! He looked very foolish, and he was about to be trampled flat. The red bull could not see him and would kill him without ever knowing that he had been in the way. Wonder and love and great sorrow shook Smendrick the magician then, and came together inside him and filled him, filled him until he felt himself brimming and flowing with something that was none of these. He did not believe it, but it came to him anyways, as it had touched him twice before and left him more barren than he had ever been. This time there was too much for it, too much of it for him to hold on to. It spilled through his skin, sprang from his fingers and toes, welled up equally in his eyes and his hair and the hollows of his shoulders. There was too much to hold, too much ever to use, and still he found himself weeping with the pain of his impossible greed. He thought, or said, or sang, I did not know that I was so empty to be so full. The Lady Amalthea lay where she had fallen, 
though now she was trying to rise, and Prince Lear still guarded her, raising his naked hands against the enormous shape that loomed over him. The tip of the prince's tongue stuck out of one corner of his mouth, making him look as serious as a child taking something apart. Lear, long years later, when Schmendrick's name had become a greater name than Nikos's, and worse than Afrit's surrender at the sound of it, he was never able to work the smallest magic without seeing Prince Lear before him, his eyes squinted up because of the brightness and his tongue sticking out. The red bull stamped again, and Prince Lear fell on his face and got up bleeding. The bull's rumble began, and the blind, bloated head started down, lowering like one half of the scales of doom. Lear's valiant heart hung between the pale horns, as good as dripping from the, the tips, himself as good as smashed and scattered, and his mouth buckled a little, but he never moved. The sound of the bull grew louder as the horns went down. Then Schmendrick stepped into the open and said a few words. They were short words, undistinguished either by melody or harshness, and Schmendrick himself could not hear them for the red bull's dreadful bawling. But he knew what they meant, and he knew exactly how to say them, and he knew that he could say them again when he wanted to, in the same way or in a different way. Now he spoke them gently and with joy, and as he did so, he felt his immortality falling from him like armor or like a shroud. At the first word of the spell, the Lady Amalthea gave a thin, bitter cry. She reached out again to Prince Lear, but he had his back to her, protecting her, and he did not hear. Molly grew heart-sick, caught at Schmendrick's arms, but the magician spoke on. Yet even when the wonder blossomed where she had been, sea-white, sea-white as boundlessly beautiful as the bull was mighty, still the Lady Amalthea clung to herself for a moment more. She was no longer there, and yet her face hovered like a breath in the cold, reeky light. It would have been better if Prince Lear had not turned until she was gone, but he turned, and he saw the unicorn, and she shone in him as if in a glass. But it was to the other that he called, to the castaway, to the Lady Amalthea. His voice was the end of her. She vanished when he cried her name, as though he had crowed for day. Things happened both swiftly and slowly as they do in dreams, where it is really the same thing. The unicorn stood very still, looking at them all out of lost elsewhere eyes. She seemed even more beautiful than Schmendrick remembered, for no one can keep a unicorn in his head for long, and yet she was not as she had been, no more than he was. Molly Grew started towards her, speaking softly and foolishly, but the unicorn gave no sign that she knew her. The marvelous horn remained as dull as rain. With a roar that set the walls of his lair belling out and crackling like a circus cavern, the red bull charged for the second time. The unicorn fled across the cave and into darkness. Prince Lear, in turning, had stepped a little to one side, and before he could wheel back again, the bull's plunging pursuit smashed him down, stunned with his mouth open. Molly would have gone to him, but Schmendrick took hold of her and dragged her along after the bull and the unicorn. Neither beast was in sight, but the tunnel still thundered from their desperate passage. Dazed and bewildered, Molly stumbled beside the fierce stranger who had neither let her fall nor slacken her pace. Over her head and all around, she could feel the castle groaning, creaking in the rock like a loosening tooth. The witch's rhyme jangled in her memory over and over. Yet none but one of Hagsgate town may bring the castle swirling down. Suddenly, it was sand slowing their feet, and the smell of the sea, cold as the other smell, but so good, so friendly, that they both stopped running and laughed aloud. Above them, on the cliff, 
King Haggard's castle splayed up towards a grey-green morning sky splashed with thin milky clouds. Molly was sure that the king himself must be watching from one of the tremulous towers, but she could not see him. A few stars still fluttered in the heavy blue sky over the water. The tide was out, and the bald beach had the grey, wet gleam of a stripped shellfish. But far down the strand, the sea was bending like a bow, and Molly knew that the ebb had ended.